right, well, welcome everyone to another great evening uh, here at YCP Detroit. Um, so great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, we have a real uh, great topic to, to discuss uh, here this evening, or a great presentation that we're going to hear from. Uh, so thank you all again for coming out. Uh, just one announcement, we're going to be doing something new this month with our YCP giveaways. If you did not receive a ticket uh, sometime between the presentation uh, before we do the raffle, please feel free to see Teresa. Um, Teresa's over, over here, I think she'll be probably in the back somewhere. Uh, feel free to, to see Teresa and grab your ticket for our, uh, our giveaway. And, uh, as we kind of advertise, the more friends you bring, uh, we're gonna try and do this in the future, the more friends we bring, uh, the more entries that we have um, into the raffle. So um, if you haven't received your ticket or tickets, if you did bring a couple friends tonight, uh, feel free to see her uh, before we do the drawing. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Father Matt for our opening blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we entrust ourselves to you as we come together tonight this might be an opportunity for our minds and hearts to be more open to your will, uh, to be more open to wisdom and the experience of others. Uh, Lord, pour forth your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we might glorify you through all that we do. We ask this in your name, your God, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, it's good to see all of you guys here tonight. I actually live here at the cathedral. Uh, so it's super easy for me to get here. So I was like, that's awesome that we're at the cathedral tonight. Uh, but it's great to be here. Uh, just one thing that I thought might be good to chat about for a second. Uh, we're coming up, at least in next month, coming up soon enough, on uh, Advent, and like really some of the most beautiful times of the liturgical year. Uh, I heard, I think it was Dorothy Day, who said that daily Mass is like Christmas every day, right? It's a gift that it keeps giving. And just to make that encouragement, maybe it's possible, maybe it's not possible for you to go to daily Mass, uh, but it's such a treasure uh, that the Church offers, you know, the, the different readings, the prayers, the different feast days throughout the week, um, to try and make that a, a goal for yourself, as we're all trying to grow as disciples, to grow closer to the Lord, uh, that's often an untapped treasure that we aren't really always attentive to. Uh, so maybe, especially leading up to Advent, make that somewhat of a, of a goal. Um, but uh, tonight, I'll be hearing confessions, and also Father Mark Tebai, uh, who was a classmate of mine, will be hearing confessions, will be in the back, uh, back there. The first confessional, Father Mark will be in. Uh, there's no screen in that confessional. Uh, and then, so if you want to go face to face, you can go there. The second one, there is a screen, um, so you have the option to go behind the screen. All right, thank you, Father Matt. Uh, so my name's Trey Bauman. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the president uh, here at YCP Detroit. Um, it, you know, today we have a real treat as we're going to be discussing Catholicism within the government. Uh, so, so kind of two things that we may think may not go together, um, but actually sometimes they do go together. And so we um, invite a, a wonderful speaker here with us tonight. So Vito Zuccaro, the director of procurement operations, and Chief of the Contracting Office of the Defense uh, Land Detroit Arsenal. Uh, so he's responsible for the procurement management of Army tanks, um, life cycle management, and Vito has been working there since 2016. So lots of various uh, government army work um, in his career. So Vito attends St. Isidore Parish up in Macomb. Um, he has two children, Joe, who's a high school economics and social studies teacher, and uh, Felicia, who's a paramedic. So he enjoys sports, card games, and uh, leadership reading. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome up uh, Mr. Vito Zuma. Thanks, Dan. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay. Thanks, Trey. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit tonight about, um, as Trey mentioned, religion in the workplace. And I want to make this valuable for you, so if you have questions or comments, I know you save until the end, that's fine, but uh, please make sure we get those answered, because I'd, like I said, I want to make this uh, valuable for everybody. Uh, you're going to have to bear with me. I'm not the most eloquent speaker, but people tell me I get my message across, so hopefully that's the case tonight. 
Um, I do have one side effect of being up here as I sometimes tend to sweat, so uh, bear with me on that. I won't get any of you wet. Uh, and there's a little handkerchief here I think I might be dipping into, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's make this um, worthwhile for you, okay? Um, so I did some research on your organization, and uh, I like what I saw. I, I had never heard about you guys until Trey informed me. Uh, I like what you stand for. I see um, hopefully a lot of growth potential. Uh, if all of you did a little networking, I'm sure you're doing that. This could be an incredible organization, uh, three or four times the size. Uh, so that's good to hear, and I, and I hope that happens to you. Um, I read in your website, and you talk about, um, see that's, when I do my town halls at work, I have 100 people, and they, I think they do the over, under, how many times I say um. So if I, if I go over a certain amount, then I have to give them a, an hour off of work. So <laughs> we'll let Trey decide how to do that. But, uh, so at your website, I, I noticed that there was something about the call, about Jennifer Baugh, and she desired guidance on balancing work and faith. So I'm hoping what I tell you today, what I present based on my experience, um, kind of helps balance that. Um, so what I want to talk about is some of the things on the agenda is who am I? I, I read about you, so it'd be good for, to you, for you to know who I am. My beliefs, Catholics in the government, uh, celebrating holy days at work, how I practice my beliefs at work, being Catholic and dealing with personnel issues, and then Catholics and COVID at work, which is obviously a hot topic. And where do we want to go as Catholics in the workplace? Um, so who am I? Uh, it's good to know a little bit about our leaders, right? It, our leaders, you know, it helps to assess um, what you think of them and if you truly think they are leaders. One thing we have to be careful of, just because people are in certain positions doesn't mean they're actually a leader, okay? I'm dealing with that every day at work. Some people in high-ranking positions are poor leaders, and they, they're hurting their organization uh, because, you know, naturally people have to follow them uh, at the workplace. Not because they want to follow them, because that's the hierarchy. So be careful of falling into that trap. Uh, you'll see when I talk a little bit more here, but I spent 31 years uh, right out of college in Army Contracting Command. That's in Warren at the uh, old tank plant, Levin and Van Dyke. So I spent 31 years there, and I could have finished my career there. But it came to a point where the leadership was, had turned really poor, and I couldn't see what, I couldn't handle what they were doing to the organization that I had been there 31 years. Um, so I left. I saw an opportunity at Defense Logistics Agency in 2016. I interviewed a couple times, uh, and they selected me. And I came to an organization that was uh, very poorly run before me. In the interview, they warned me that um, the two leaders before me had really destroyed that organization. So I figured, well, I'm going to really give myself a test to see if I'm really the leader I think I am. And another thought is, well, I can only go up, right? If it's the worst, we can't go down. So that's kind of why I left the Army. You always hear the saying, maybe you've heard the saying, people don't quit jobs, they quit their leaders. Um, so that's what I did. I quit the leadership at the Army that appeared to be very poor. And I don't regret it. They're still struggling. Funny story, though, I, when I left, soon after I left, the position of director there, the highest position there, became open. I applied, and they said they weren't, they weren't going to interview me. So they didn't want me back, and that's okay. I just uh, I thought I could do there what I was able to do in my organization I'm at now is turn things around. And I'll explain more about that as we go on. Just a little bit about me, right? So I attended something called Senior Service College Fellowship. It was a 10-month leadership training program that was done in conjunction between the Army and Lawrence Tech. So at the end of this 10 months, you get a master's degree and you uh, graduate from Senior Service College Fellowship, which is very similar or akin to Army War College. So a college that all the generals go to, um, this was the civilian version of that. So that was a 10-month program. And during this 10 months, I wasn't allowed to go to work. It was strictly um, trips, deal with um, senior leaders, and um, Lawrence Tech classes. So I had already had a master's degree before this, 
but I was voluntold that they want me in this because it was the initial startup program and uh, they wanted me to be a part of that. So I would never have wanted to go personally to get two masters. I had my heart set on trying to become a doctor or a doctorate level, uh, but things got in the way, family and work, and I ended up just keeping the two masters. I also have a bachelor degree from Walsh. Um, so I spent five years where I'm at now, Defense Logistics Agency. So what that organization does, it pretty much if the soldier eats it, drinks it, wears it, shoots it, rides in it, wear, anything to do with a soldier pretty much goes through Defense Logistics Agency. About 26,000 people strong, uh, pretty much what logistics do. They get parts and goods and services to the warfighter all over the world. So that's Defense Logistics Agency. Where I was previously at was the Army, and that, where I was responsible for buying uh, tanks and vehicles for the soldiers. So a little different version. What I do now is my office buys sustainment for vehicles. So we buy major spare parts, um, gun barrels, uh, wheel assemblies, uh, a lot of sight for the vehicles. So we buy major spare parts. So we're not buying the vehicles anymore, but we buy the sustainment for it. Um, just so you know, it's good to know about leaders. As I mentioned, Myers-Briggs, INFJ, introverted, intuitive, feeling, judging. So this is a growth opportunity for me to be up here. Like I said, I'm not an eloquent speaker. It's not that I get too nervous. I just don't have the gift of uh, gab, and I don't, I'm not very good at BSing people. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I taught catechism at St. Isidore for eight years. I remember I fell into the position. I, uh, was, I was taking my kids in to get enrolled in catechism. We had just moved to Macomb. And she said they only had openings for people, um, but they needed, the person, the parent needed to be a, a, a teacher. So I said, how hard can this be, right? It, it's an hour and a half a week. Well, they gave me eighth grade, which, you know, we all know eighth graders, right? So, um, but it was a really good experience for me. Um, and I could see myself doing that again maybe when I retire. But, and I've been a supervisor in the business for 25 years, so... Um, a lot of experience dealing with people, uh, a lot of experience, and I tell my folks this and people I mentor, as leaders you have to lead up, down, and sideways. Okay, you have to do all the above. If you fail in any of those facets, you're not going to be as efficient and you're going to have, um, you're going to show your weaknesses. So that's what I try to mentor folks is leading up, down, and sideways. Um, some of my beliefs, okay, so you should be able to trust your leaders, right? They're in charge. They're calling the shots. Um, but they should have your interest in mind, all right? They should have the worker's best interest in mind. Part of a job of a leader, you know, it's a mentor, it's a coach. Uh, it's also um, an opportunity enabler. So you have to work with your people to get them to the next level. You just don't... Uh, it's not just a position where it's, um, it's stagnant. It's a very proactive position. And when I first became a supervisor 25 years ago, I had a team of about 10, and we were buying Bradley fighting vehicles. You've probably seen them on TV. And we were doing a really good job. We'd award millions of dollars a year. And some of my people became really good at being contract specialists. Uh, after a while, some of these people went for interviews and became promoted to the next level out of my team. So at first I thought, boy, this, this is not really fair. I'm building these people up and they're leaving me. So we're taking a well-oiled machine and now I got some holes in it. So it took me about a year to realize, no, that's a good thing, all right? Because it's for the whole and the best of the organization. So that's what leaders need to do. They need to train people up to take their positions. So you folks in, in your roles, you need to make sure your leaders are doing that for you. Make sure they're working your best interest and getting you to that next level so you can help the organization. That's what you have to make sure your leaders can do. And sometimes you have to help your leaders do that. Um, and I remember as I was growing up in the organizations, a lot of things I did to, to try and become the best I could be was I did a lot of the crap jobs that no one wanted to do. Um, and I just said, give me those. You know, I'll take those on. And after a while, you develop a name for yourself. Um, because sometimes, well, as you guys know, not sometimes, but a lot of times, it's very competitive in the workplace. So you have to do something to uh, distinguish yourself 
from your competition, you know, without playing hardball, because um, if you do that, that's, everyone's going to find that out, and you're not going to be a valued person. Um, so just a little tidbit there. Um, I, I know I had this situation just this week where I, had a, I was mentoring someone, and she said, one of her subordinates said that she treats them like children. So I said, yeah, I, she does have small children at home too. So that's one of the things you have to watch out for is that you know, you tr people will sometimes react the way you treat them. So if you treat them like children, they may act like children. So it's just something to be cognizant of. And that's really good feedback. That maybe hurts your feelings a little bit, but that's good feedback so you can have self-awareness, right? So it, it, there are a lot of tools out there, things like uh, 360 analysis and things like that where you can see yourself from the other side anonymously. And those are important. Um, sometimes they'll expose weaknesses and it hurts, but you need to see what's out there and how people, uh, how people are being, or how you're being perceived by people uh, to help with your development. So that's what those tools are for. And it, it's good to get feedback sometimes that's negative so you, can, uh, so you can work it out. Like I'm sure if I asked you guys tonight after this presentation, can you give me some constructive feedback? I'm sure every hand would go up and I'd be okay with that. Um, but probably nothing I haven't heard before, but it's still good to say, hey, you still need to work on this. You say this too much. You use your hands too much. Things like that. But it's good to know um, about yourself. So as I talked about these things that good leaders should be, mentors, coaches, developers, I think Jesus was like that, right? I mean, Jesus was a teacher. Everywhere he went, he taught, be it on a boat, in the desert, uh, in synagogues, in temples. Jesus taught. Jesus was the ultimate mentor. So these things that I'm telling you are not just something to get ahead in the business world. It's something to do in your life. All right? It doesn't have to be at work. A lot of these things permeate. Um, they permeate workplace, people at workplace, people outside of work, like this organization. You actually have mentors here that are, that are doing a great service to you. Uh, you'll be mentors if you aren't already. And sometimes uh, we're unofficial mentors. Uh, people watch us. You know, I talked about, you know, leading like tr treating people like children. But like children watch their parents, your workers watch you. So it comes down to um, your actions and not so much your words. Okay? Hopefully those two coincide and go hand in hand. But so people watch you all the time. So you need to be at your best and try to develop yourself. So back to Jesus. So Jesus mentored the apostles. Jesus developed people. Jesus healed people. Um, so we see many similarities of how we're supposed to act uh, in the workplace and in our lives. Now, Catholics in the government. So I did some research and I, I saw that about 22% of the population is Catholic. That seemed a little light to me, and I hope that's wrong, but that's what, it, that's what uh, research came out, and I checked a couple places. But I also checked the House of Representatives and, and the Senate, and those are about 22% and 33% respectively. So a little better uh, than average. Some of our high-ranking officials in the government are Catholic. Um, obviously, you know that. Um, and it's okay to display some of, the, some of your religious beliefs in the workplace, believe it or not. Uh, I know I've seen presidents give the sign of the cross at certain events. Um, I know when, when I was part of the Army and even now at DLA and they do these military ceremonies, um, we had an admiral get promoted uh, about a month ago, and uh, you know they they uh, they give a blessing, they say a prayer. All right, this is this is all religion in the workplace, where some, some people might think, well, it's the government, it's taboo, you can't do that. No, we do, and we do it regularly. Uh, and a lot of people participate. Obviously, some don't, uh, but it's out there, and it's like I said, it's the actions and not just the words. Uh, so that's good to see. Um, like I said, Sean Steins, you know, even our first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, you know, he, he always said he wasn't a Catholic um, candidate. He was a Democratic candidate who happened to be Catholic. So even there we see, and he faced a lot of anti-sentiment. Uh, anti yeah, you know, he did. He, and presidents today still do. It's, people think that the Catholic religion is too closely tied to the religion and to the Pope and not the government. So, you know, we have to fight through that. Um, but one of the things I want to leave with you is that, in that area, is that a lot of these leaders are senior leaders, and they're in their 60s and beyond. 
And so we have to make sure the gap doesn't widen. We have to make sure that 22% doesn't go lower. And we have to make sure the percent of Catholics in the government goes higher. Um, just a side note, I don't know if any of you ever thought about the government as a career, but it, you know, when I came out of Walsh, I, uh, I applied and was, uh, was hired, but I had never thought I would be, you know, I didn't even know what a contracting person was in the Army, uh, but it's turned out to be an excellent career. Um, so if, if you see that opportunity uh, and you think it's for you, the government is a good career in the long run, okay? It's like the tortoise and the hare. You're not going to shoot out of the gate, but over time you're going to be in good shape. Just FYI, <clears throat> I usually have these on the board, but it's okay, I understand, and this is good. Okay, so, you know, people can say, what about separation of church and state? Well, we just gave you examples of praying at ceremonies, uh, making the sign of a cross, things like that, uh, kneeling in the public. So even though there is a separation of church and state, um, because of the First Amendment, you know, we have the right to our religion and freedom of speech. Yeah, so we have that. Um, and I have a, a passage here from Luke and Matthew. They talk about the golden rule. You know, obviously do unto others as you'd have done to you. So that's just the way that I operate in my world at, at work is the golden rule. Just treat people, you know, with respect and dignity, no matter what kind of performer they are. I know some leaders who treat their poor performers like crap. And that's the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be helping those poor performers become better, not just, um, you know, dissing them. For instance, when I became a supervisor uh, many years ago, I had a problem employee who wouldn't do any work, and people said, I oh, just give him a coloring book and put him in a corner, and he won't make any trouble. I said, no, nah, I have nine other people in that team who are watching me, and if I deal with them like that, I lose all leadership credibility. It's gone. So I dealt with that person and ended up terminating that person. So it's another myth that you can't terminate people in the government. Yeah, you can, and I've terminated about 10 in my career. Not because I wanted to, because as a Catholic, I don't want to put someone on the street who may have a family they have to feed, but i got to be fair, right? If the person's not doing their job, then either I'm going to take away their pay or I'm going to fire them. I can't take away their pay unless I suspend them, and that just um, kind of permeates the problem. This is all after I try to work with them, okay? This is not a conclusion I come to and quickly say, I need to terminate somebody. No, you try to work with them, and sometimes people just don't respond, and maybe they're in over their heads. Maybe you've seen in your career where they promote people to different positions just to get them out of there, so someone else has to deal with them. Well, eventually someone's got to pay that price, right? It's going to catch up to somebody. So that's what happens there. But that's just, um, and that's in another section, but that's one of the issues of um, personnel issues and being Catholic is doing the right thing at all times, having integrity. Um, I've been in situations, personnel situations, where um, people think they've been wrong somehow, and it's like in an interview panel, for instance. We don't pick somebody, and they say we're, um, we're biased against them or something, and we had something against them. And sometimes they take it up to a point where we have to go to court so imagine all this time being wasted over, you know, what I think is wasted because the panel is usually going to do the right thing. Um, so you have to testify. And a lot of times I've seen people just say, hey, we made a mistake, we should have given them promotion, and that stops the whole ball. But that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, sure, I have to go testify three times in court and I can't do my work, but the right thing needs to be done and people can't manipulate you just because something's a burden. Um, so these are things in the workplace as a Catholic that I have to follow myself and pray about that I'm doing the right thing, uh, even though the easy thing would be so much quicker and, and better off, but and maybe not better off, but just quicker and less painful. Um, uh, you know, your, your website talked about how to um, combine work and, and, and being a Catholic and being a professional. There's a, um, a publication that comes out, I don't know if it's quarterly or every other month, it's called um, Unleash the Gospel. Well, I got a quote from there that kind of goes hand in hand with, with what your purpose is. The Catechism points out that, cre that as creatures made in God's image, we work just as God did. And our work is a duty and honors the gifts and talents God has given us. All work, whether it be in a field, a home, an office, a hospital, a retail store, and so on, has value. God desires us to work with him in our work. 
That is just a beautiful summary of, of, of religion in the workplace, how they can coexist. Um, and you know, and it's important to practice that because we are who we are. I always tell my people, you know, you can't check your personal life at the door when you come into work. There's just, you can't, you're affected, it impacts you. So the more you try to be, or try to have the values of a, a God-like or Jesus-like values, the better off you're going to be in your personal life and your home life. Very easy to say, very hard to do, as we know, in case we're all human, right? So at work, we, we talk about celebrating the holy days. So we do that at work, believe it or not, in the government. So for uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, at 12 o'clock in the auditorium, we have a mass, and people get ashes there. And then you can wear them, um, you know, obviously wear the ashes the rest of the day in the workplace in meetings, and people can obviously see that you're a Christian, and that's a good thing. And it's, we have an auditorium of about 400 seats, and I'd say it's about three quarters full. And it's nice to see coworkers, because a lot of times you don't talk about this at work, but then when you see someone at work, it kind of draws you even closer, um, and there's a better understanding. And even people not in your office, people in your other offices who sometimes are contentious, if you see that, wow, you know, they got their ashes, hey, they're a Catholic, you know, maybe you got to try something different in reaching out to them. Um, so all good stuff. But we celebrate the Easter, Christmas, all those kind of holidays. And the Army has an annual prayer breakfast uh, that's attended by many people. And uh, we have prayers and, in all different languages, in all different religions. It's really cool, actually. Um, and it's really good fellowship. So these are things in the government that, that, that are happening. Um, and when, you know, you try to encourage coworkers, hey, I'm going to the prayer breakfast, you want to go? And sometimes they'll come for the breakfast, but then maybe some of that will sink into them, the message. So all good stuff and all things that are happening. So how I practice my beliefs at work additionally too, um, sometimes I'll, I'll end a note, uh, God bless you, or Godspeed. I, don't get, I, don't, I haven't gotten any negative feedback on that. Yeah, you want to ignore it, you ignore it. But sometimes I'll do that. Uh, I don't all the time because I know some people I can't uh, approach it that way, but a lot of people I can, and that's a good thing. So I attend the masses at work. I encourage others to go. I have a calendar on my desk with biblical verses. People come in, they see it right in the middle of my desk. That's, I think that's all good stuff. And it's all in, in, in the guise of just trying to be a good Christian and help people up. All right, people are struggling, and a lot of times you don't even know that they're struggling. Obviously with suicides, right? If we knew people were struggling that much, we would step in, but sometimes you have no clue. Uh, what, we, what we instituted um, about six months ago in my office is once every two weeks at lunchtime, we have an hour open sensing session. So any coworker can call in and talk about anything they want during that lunch hour. And it's really turned out to be a value. I mean, we've had people um, that we discovered had some mental health issues. The Army and DLA have a lot of resources, so we were able to get them help. What a great feeling, even if one person, it was actually more than one, but it was a younger person who was struggling, and she didn't tell anybody, but when she got this sensing session, she kind of let loose a little. Guards were down, and, and, you know, and it was a really good feeling knowing we could help her. Um, and we had parents come together at the session, and they didn't even know their coworker had a child with autism. Hey, my child has autism. Can we sit down and compare notes and talk further how, what the best way to, to care for these kids? So this is all good stuff, and that's just a one-hour sensing session. My admiral liked that so much, she, she took it up to the top level, said, hey, look what's happening in Warren. Look at this good stuff they're doing. And it, it's not work, right? It's not work. Can't say we awarded a billion dollars, you know, we do that every year, but it's, it's not work-related, but not, it's people-related, and people do the work. So there's a huge tie together. And, and, and it's like I said before about the kids watching the parents, you know, people know when you care about them, all right? You can't fake that. I always tell my supervisors under me when they're dealing with their people, don't try to snow the workforce. They're too smart. You guys are too smart for that. And sometimes you need to let your leadership know that. Hey, you come on, you know, that's, that's silly. But these are just things that, um, that happen in the workplace where it just tries to make people better, give them help. All right, same thing could be happening at church, right? Helping people who are suicidal, people who are struggling at home with children. Yeah, we got a place at work we can do that. That's why at work offers a lot of help because we have a lot of invested in you, right? We pay a lot, and not just salaries, it's, it's benefits, it's, it's training, it's years of experience. 
um, that we need you. We need you. And I close a lot of my emails with people, especially around the holidays, like, hey, you guys be careful out there this weekend. All right? We need you. Okay? Um, just something I want to leave you there. So other things I do at work, I wear a crucifix. Sometimes it comes out, sometimes it doesn't. But if it does, that's great. Um, and you know what I do sometimes in a, before a meeting? Uh, I really don't do this with the higher ranking people because I don't know how they would take it. But you know sometimes when you go to a meeting, there's people rushing in and they've got their papers and their notebooks and their computers and they're fumbling around for the first minute. they got their coffee, whatever. So I say, hey, let's take this minute and think about uh, what, how you want this meeting to go in your mind. Now, I open that door because I know some people are going to pray about that. So it's, they're going to take that minute and, and pray about not only the meeting, but about themselves, okay? Sometimes that's the only time during the day they pray. You know, when I taught eighth grade catechism, I opened every class with, okay, kids, we're going to take one minute to pray. You're going to pray to yourself. You're not going to say it out loud. I don't care if you daydream. I don't care if, if you take a one-minute nap. You're going to take this time to pray. And some of them did. Probably some didn't. But it was a chance for them to say, hey, okay, this is prayer time. It, prayer time could be anywhere. It could be at home. It could be at, at work. It could be at school. It could be a catechism. It's good to try to initiate something like that, to try to be more Christian-like and help people cope. Um, so being Catholic and dealing with personnel issues. So I had a case last year where I had to fire somebody. Didn't want to do it. It, it killed me. I knew he had three kids. Um, we went to arbitration. He was crying. And it killed me. It kills me now. Um, but, you know, the guy just wouldn't do work. He just wouldn't do work. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, I've got 100 people here watching you, watching what's going on. What do they think of me if I just let you do nothing and pay you the same as they're getting paid and they're busting their butts? It killed me to terminate this person. Um, but we had to. And that goes against maybe what I believe, right? Because I don't want to put people on the street. I'm talking about helping people who are on the street. I don't want to add to it. I don't know, I, you know, I don't know about his kids. But people, you know, we just have to deal the way we have to deal. And even as I read the passage to you, God expects us to do work, right? Jesus worked. The apostles worked. We expect people to do good work and have value. Uh, I talked about just testifying and doing the right thing in court and integrity. Um, you know, and we've had something uh, with dealing with contractors, okay? Something called um, defective pricing. So what that is is we'd negotiate contracts with contractors, and they would give us their best price and certify to it. This is the most current price. I have no other documentation. This is the price. And usually it's in the millions, right? Uh, so then we would come back, an audit agency would audit the, the records and books and say, oh, wait a minute, Mr. Contractor, you actually paid $10 for this part that you sold to the government, um, but you charged the government $30. And you certified that the 10 was, or the 30 was right. So now you owe us money. So that's the effective price. And that kind of goes against, did you do it intentionally? Uh, was there fraud? Or it was just something that slipped, or a mistake. So just, you know, something to think about, that it happens at all levels. And just a side note, I was negotiating a deal for some Bradley fighting vehicles, and we had settled the deal. It was about $250 million, And the contractor was found to have defective pricing worth $10 million. So I said, yeah, you need to send a check to the IRS. So they actually sent a check to me in my name for $10 million. I'm thinking, wow, it's lunchtime. Canada's uh, 20 minutes away. <laughs> There's the integrity there. <laughs> but anyway, just a little quick story about that. But it happens at all levels, right? People are out there trying to game the system. Uh, but so that's why it's important to keep our Christian values at work and at home. Again, very easy for me to say that. Hard to do. Very hard to do. But we've got to keep trying because that's what we do as Christians. We keep trying to, to be the best we can be. And we keep trying to make other people better at the workplace and at home. So I'm just wrapping up here. I know I'm against the clock, but let me, just leave, let me just talk about something real quick. So you know um, the president mandated that all government workers must have the vaccine. All right, so, but there's, there's two ways to not have it if you so choose. You can claim a religious exception or you can claim a medical exception. Uh, so medical exception kind of speaks for itself, right? Something's going to happen if you have the, the vaccine. Uh, but the religious one 
It's what your religious beliefs are that prevent you from receiving this vaccine. So I think they're trying to, to checkmate everybody because listen, listen to the questions that you have to answer if you claim religious exception. So this is what the government's saying. Please describe the nature of your objection to the COVID vaccine. Would complying with COVID-19 vaccine requirements substantially burden your religious exercise? If so, explain. How long have you held the religious belief underlying your objection? Please describe whether as an adult you have received any other vaccines against any other diseases, and if so, what vaccine you most recently and when to your best of recollection? Two more. If you do not have religious objection to the use of all vaccines, please explain why your objection is limited to particular vaccines. Are there, if there are any other medications or products that you do not use because of religious belief, please identify them. They're really trying to paint you in a corner if you claim religious exemption. Now, so far, we've, I say we have about 30 people in my office apply for the religious exception. They haven't um, ruled yet, but I heard a rumor that, hey, you know, the Pope's in favor of the vaccine. Uh, so, you know, that, could that shoot down? I don't know. We're going to see what happens. Um, because if the folks don't get vaccinated and their exception is not approved, they're going to be terminated. And I told my people, we're going to be the last ones in the government to terminate anybody because of religious exception. You better come bring your firepower if you expect me to fire somebody because of that. So just some thought about how the government, um, I don't want to get into that, but just I want you to be aware of the six questions they're asking people if they want the religious exception. So the bottom line is, you have a certain belief. Can the government really say that's not your belief? But how do you fight that? How do you fight that? Yeah. I'm just about done here, Trey. Sorry. Yeah, so hey, where do we want to go? So I talked this many times. We've got to keep evolving. This organization needs to keep evolving. This has the potential to be, it's great now. I've, I've seen the interaction. I see what you guys do. I see a lot of smile faces. I see you guys here at 9 o'clock at night. That's great, but keep evolving. Keep doing the leading up, down, sideways. Get more people. You've you got a great, great thing going, Hill. Um, keep helping others. Like I said, if, if you help just one person, like that one-hour sensing session, if we help one person, we've done more than enough. All right? People are struggling out there. Some of you may be struggling. There's help. And if you can help your fellow buddy here or, or gal, pal, or whatever, just do it, all right? Reach out. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to be bold. Anyway, um, last thought is just actions speak louder than words. So if you continue to act like Christians and, and have your beliefs and values, people will see you, and that's called leading by example. Hey, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. I hope that's all right. So right now we're going to go into the Q&A portion. So a lot of you received a card, or many of you or all of you should have received a card when you came in. Um, if you do have any questions for Vito, feel free to go ahead and text it in to the number at the top right of the card. That number is 313-483-7272. And we'll kind of go into our, our Q&A portion. So Vito, kind of starting off, you talked about how um, you know, you wear your crucifix and you, you say God bless you in some of your emails. Has there ever been a time at work that you have evangelized somebody or have talked about or, you know, uh, encouraged them to go to Mass or have changed their, their viewpoints on Catholicism? Um, I've had people that we talked to um, come to Mass, yes. Uh, the person that I helped come to Mass didn't change uh, their religion, uh, but it did help as far as understanding and, and realizing that, hey, there are some different religions out there that they like things about. So it was a good awareness thing. Uh, the person still a religious person, just a different, different religion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second question is specifically when you, I mean, obviously you're in a government entity and, um, you know, the basis behind the government is politics. How do you kind of distance yourself? I know a lot of us are maybe starting in our careers or maybe kind of moving up the chain in our careers. How do you avoid getting involved in those politics or the, that, you know, the politicalness of some organizations? 
You know what, it comes down to um, doing the right thing, Trey. Uh, sometimes it's going to put you in a bad light because you're not going to be part of the, the gang or something, but you've got you've to do the right thing. And if you see something that's wrong but it looks popular, it, it really it goes back to even high school times. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to, to, not, to, to break that, but you have to for yourself and then others because a lot of times the politics, they run themselves into trouble. And all of a sudden, someone comes down with a different view, and those people are not favored anymore. So, you know, these things happen, and you have to see bigger picture. Like I tell my folks you know, who want uh, to evolve into leaders, is like, you got to get away from not only thinking tactically, you have to think strategically, right? you got to think bigger. Um, sure, you have to do the day-to-day -day and do it well, but then you got to look beyond that. And that's what separates the folks who are at the level not ready yet to folks who are ready, who see it. Yeah, and so specifically with your line of work, you know, the procurement of, of tanks and, and some of this warfare that you use, has, have you ever had any, like, ethical concerns as far as the, the, the product you're working around versus being a Catholic? Uh, yeah, yeah, sometimes it crosses our mind, it does. Especially when we see a lot of the new technology, um, the warfare that's out there. Uh, we think, boy, that can do some serious damage, and it does cross your mind that, hey, you know, I've said before to my people, and I still believe that now, it's my, it's my conviction, and I said this when I first started, if, if I didn't have a job because there was peace in the world, then that's what I want. I'd want that peace, honestly, I'm not just saying that. I said it, now I got 30-something years, no one's touching me, but I said it when I was a rookie, and I could have been laid off or fired, you know, I, that's what my belief was. So yes, it does cross our mind. And some people um, refuse to work on the armaments part of work. Yeah, they want to buy the wheels and the, the tires and the wheel assemblies and the shock absorbers, but keep me away from the guns and the rifles and the ammunition. Yeah. I respect yeah, I that. that. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that you do currently in your workplace, you, you deepen your faith. Um, you know, like you had mentioned, but there are, are there certain instances within your work that have really challenged your faith, uh, whether it's people, missions, uh, work tasks, anything like that? Has anything ever challenged it? Yeah, yeah it, what challenges me the most, and sometimes I regret this, but it's, it's for the best. That I, Sometimes I want to react to people who I know are doing um, some nasty things and not treating my people right, or even me. I want to react unprofessionally sometimes. Um, but it's very hard to do. Like, I don't know if you guys know, um, if you remember this General Perna, four-star general in the Army. Um, he was the guy who uh, led uh, the vaccine development, uh, warp speed. Okay, so I worked with him a lot, the four-speed, uh, four-star general, and I'd have to brief him, and sometimes he would just say crap like, um, for instance, we, as part of our requirements to award contracts, we have to see if there are small businesses who can perform some of the work. All right, it's part of the small business initiative. The problem is it takes a lot of time sometimes to get a small business to do the work for you. And sometimes those small businesses can't do the work after you've given them a contract. So then you put your way behind. So General Perner gets mad and he makes a comment, I don't give a damn about small business. And I'm like, I felt like saying, sir, I don't care if you don't give a damn, but that's a law I gotta follow. So it's things like that where I wanna say, geez, you're really missing a boat, buddy. But you know. You got to suck it up, and he's a four star, and I'm not. <laughs> well, thank you, Vito, for a wonderful, wonderful okay. presentation. You're uh, welcome. This evening. Thanks, sir. As, as a token of our gratitude, we wanted to give you a gift. Uh, oh, wow. It's our uh, Saint, Saint Joseph the Worker. Thank, thank you. Uh, for you. And if you didn't get a chance to uh, ask Vito, or if your question did not get answered, he will be around for a few minutes um, if you'd like to approach him. Um, and offer your question to him. Um, so in closing, oh, I'd wonderful. like to invite uh, Teresa Miranda up to give some closing announcements. We know what's going on. I'm my best. best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Joseph, by the work of your hands and the sweat of your brow, you supported Jesus and Mary, and as the Son of God as your fellow worker. Teach me to work as you did, with patience and perseverance, for God and for those whom God has given me to support. Teach me to see in my fellow workers the Christ who desires to be in them, that I may always be cheerful and forbearing towards all. Grant me to look upon work with the eyes of faith, so that I shall recognize it in my 
my share in God's own creative activity and in Christ's work of our redemption, and so take pride in it. When it is pleasant and productive, remind me to give thanks to God for it, and when it is burdensome, teach me to offer it to God in reparation for my sins and the sins of the world. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.